After reciting the Tashahud, <coughs> Da'os, Tasmiyah, and Surah Fatiha, Hazrat Nuri Muhammad Ayyad Allah Ta'ala bin Asil Aziz said, the promised Messiah alayhi salam in his book Kashti Anu, i.e. Noah's Ark, writes, God desires a complete transformation in your being and he demands from you a death whereafter he should revive you. Hasten to make peace with one another and forgive your brethren their sins. For he who is not inclined to make peace with his brother is wicked and will be cut off because he is the cause of dissension. The Prophet Messiah continues to say part with your ego in every way and do away with mutual grievances. Be humble like the guilty, though truth be on your side, so that you may be forgiven. Do not feed your vanity, for those who are bloated cannot enter the gate to which you have been called. The one who most forgives the transgressions of his brother is the more honorable among you. This excerpt is often presented before the majority of the Jamaat members in various speeches and sermons. The sentence regarding being humble like the guilty, though truth be on one side, is such that the majority of the Ahmadis quote it at various occasions. They even write it to me when presenting the details to their mutual dealings, saying that we adopted such an attitude, but the other party continues to adopt a cruel standpoint against us. In the previous Friday sermon, I also spoke about the Qadha and cases of dispute. These words of the Promised Messiah السلام, which he included in his teachings are an expression of his expectations from his followers and of his heartfelt pain for them. When one reads the section of our teaching in Kashti Anu in its entirety, one is left shaken. As I stated before, these few words are presented before us repeatedly. However, there are still some among us who are not ready to forgive and to accept the hand extended to them for reconciliation. As I have just stated, some people say that we adopted meekness, accepted all terms for the sake of reconciliation. Yet, the other party continued to adopt a cruel attitude. Thus, if the other party is indeed as they claim, then they should rest their case with God Almighty. The Promised Messiah السلام, has said that such a person will be cut off. He further stated that unfortunate is the one who is obstinate and does not forgive. Thus, there is a stark warning for those who are stubborn. They should come to their senses. The 
On the one hand, after entering into the bed of the promised Messiah, Islam, we make this pledge that we shall not create disorder and shall save ourselves from selfish passions. But on the other hand, we even desist reconciliation. This amounts to an estrangement from the pledge of Baird, i.e. initiation. This does not equate to fulfilling the Pledge of Baird. The Promised Messiah at one occasion stated, Our Jamaat should be such that they do not remain content with mere words. They should not prove themselves to be Ahmadis by mere words. He states, Rather, they should be such that they fulfill the true intent and purpose of Baird. A true internal change should be brought about. You cannot please Allah the Almighty just by gaining an understanding of the arguments. There is no internal change and there is no difference between you and the others. Thus, the Promised Messiah has very clearly stated that Allah the Almighty cannot be pleased without fulfilling the purpose of the Bayt. And in order to please Allah the Almighty, the fulfillment of the rights of His servants and being at absolute peace with them is also important. Whilst describing His condition and expressing His quality of immense forbearance and remission, the Promised Messiah says, I swear by God that if a person who has called me the Antichrist and a liar even a thousand times, moreover, he has exhausted all his resources in opposing me, yet he then extends his hand in friendship, then I would never think, nor would it be possible for me to think about what he has said to me or the way he has treated me in the past. The Promised Messiah then counsels us by saying, My advice is that you should keep two things in mind. Firstly, fear the one God. Secondly, show sympathy to your brothers in the same manner that you show towards yourself. Whatever you want for yourselves or you desire to be treated sympathetically, you should extend the same to your brothers. The Promised Messiah says that if someone commits a mistake or an error, they should be forgiven. His mistakes and errors should not be highlighted further. One should not get into the habit of holding a grudge against such people. Therefore, we should always keep in mind that in the world we live in today, there is chaos and disorder everywhere. Thus, although having taken the oath of allegiance of the Promised Messiah, we consider ourselves to have come under a fortress, whilst at the same time being grateful to God Almighty for the fact that Allah has safeguarded us from the general disarray of the world. We can only truly be protected by continuously thinking about treating others with tenderness in our normal daily affairs. We have to lay the foundation of friendship. Otherwise, our actions will be limited to mere words. And our claim will remain confined to an affirmation that we have benefited from entering the Jamaat of the Promised Messiah We can make this assertion, however, it might not be the truth. We will truly benefit only when every aspect of good morals is shining from within us.
The Promised Messiah has repeatedly instructed us to adopt the qualities of being sympathetic towards mankind and establishing mutual friendship. Therefore, every Ahmadi should focus on this. There are a few other excerpts of the Prophet Islam, and the Prophet has discussed this again and again in some of his books and the Malfuzat. A hadith states that the Holy Prophet said, A strong person is not one who can wrestle and defeat the other. Rather, a strong person is the one who can control his temper in a moment of rage and anger. Hence, it is the hallmark of a believer to demonstrate such high morals. One should have self-control in a state of anger. A non-believer can never act upon this. In fact, he becomes astonished at this command. There is an incident of Hazrat Ali radiallahu anhu where on one occasion he had overpowered an enemy and had full control over him. It was well nigh that he would kill him when all of a sudden he spat on Hazrat Ali's face. Hazrat Ali radiallahu anhu left him immediately. He inquired, why did you let me go in such a state? Hazrat Ali radiallahu anhu responded, by saying, At first, I was about to kill you for being an enemy of Islam. You were opposing it and were fighting against it. Now that you spat on my face, it became personal, and I do not wish to kill anyone because of personal enmity. These are the high standards presented to us by our elders. We witness them in our history. It is a believer's hallmark to control his anger and to be inclined towards reconciliation. But a non-believer can never think about this. This is the grandeur of the Promised Messiah desire to establish in us so that the true teachings of Islam are expressed from our every action. The true Islamic teaching that spreads the knowledge of forgiveness and forbearance. Hence, on one occasion, during one of his sittings, the Promised Messiah said, our community does not require the strength of powerful men and warriors. We do not need strong people or wrestlers. But instead, we require the powerful ones who endeavor to change their morals and take them to higher levels. The Prophet Islam continues to stay. It is a proven fact that the strong person is not he who can move mountains. Of course not. The true brave person is he who has the ability to change his manners, to control himself and adopt high morals. The Promised Messiah continues to say, So keep in mind that you should exert all your efforts and strengths into changing your morals, as this is the true strength and bravery. Thus, this should be our target. Then, in another sitting, the Promised Messiah stated, in my mind, anyone who abandons his evil ways and bad habits and adopts good habits, he endeavors to abandon bad manners and bad habits and adopts good morals and good habits. Then this in itself is a miracle for him. To abandon evil and adopt good habits is a miracle and phenomenon for him. The taking place of this change, i.e. to attain high morals, is a miracle for all. Some people object by saying what miracle has happened or been shown after taking the oath of allegiance. 
After taking the oath of allegiance, this in itself is a miracle that one adopts high morals and forsakes evil. He continues to say, For example, if an ill-tempered and angry person abandons such habits, and in turn adopts kindness and forgiveness, or forsakes miserliness for generosity, or even attains to sympathy in place of jealousy, then indeed this is a miracle. To adopt good morals, abandon evils, embrace good manners, give up anger, instill the habit of forgiveness and kindness, forsake miserliness, and be generous, hold feelings of sympathy for others instead of envying them, then most surely this is a miracle and revolution which is taking place in you. In the same way, whoever abandons self-praise and vanity and adopts humility and meekness, then this humility in itself is a miracle. So who among you wishes not to become marvelous? <coughs> I know full well that everyone wishes to be so. Then know this, that this is an everlasting and living miracle. If there is ever an internal miracle, then it is this miracle, phenomenon and revolution which you must instill in yourselves, i.e. to abandon sin and bad morals and to adopt high morals. Man must rectify his moral state because this is such a miracle, the effect of which will never diminish, but will continue to benefit for a long time. It behoves a believer to be marvelous in the sight of the creation and the creator. How you become marvelous in the sight of God Almighty and the creation. Become those who fulfill the rights of God Almighty and also the rights of creation. Many fraudsters and charlatans have gone by who did not acknowledge any extraordinary sign. But after witnessing a moral state, they bow down in submission. Plenty of criminals, wicked people and charlatans witnessed signs but did not change their state. Yet when they witnessed the moral state, they bowed their heads and submitted and they had no other choice but to admit and confess. You will find in the lives of many people that they accepted the truth having witnessed moral miracles. On this occasion, when the Prophet Messiah was narrating this incident, there was a practical example of his character, as I have mentioned several times before. At that time, two Sikh gentlemen came and sat down in that sitting. They began speaking needlessly, cursing and uttering irrelevant things. They continued to speak in this manner in his sitting and in the mosque. Yet the Prophet Messiah said nothing and listened quietly. In that moment, the feelings of the people were of wonderment as to how the Prophet Messiah displayed such high moral qualities when it was happening in his place, in his sitting, and there were Ahmadis all around. Yet he gave no one the permission to reply and they said and profaned whatever they could and left. After which the police caught them. Thus, this was the high level and his example which the Prophet of Islam displayed before his followers. Whilst explaining that if the worm of selfishness does not believe man, then he does not believe in the oneness of God. The promised Messiah states, In reality, these worms of selfishness cannot leave without the grace of God Almighty. So we must strive to attain the grace of God Almighty. The Prophet Messiah further states, These are very subtle worms which are the most dangerous and damaging. Those who transgress the limits and rights of God Almighty by being affected by their selfish desires and in turn violate the rights of creation are not necessarily uneducated. 
but you will find thousands of them to be clerics and scholars. Many of them are so-called jurists and mystics. But despite all of this, they too are afflicted by these diseases. It is not only the ignorant that fail to fulfill the rights of God Almighty and mankind. And if the opportunity arises, they try to violate the rights of others. The Prophet Muhammad further stated, In truth, many educated people from among the scholars are such. What is more, that those who have religious knowledge and in the eyes of the world are deemed great jurists, mystics and holy men are also afflicted by this very disease, i.e. when they are given the opportunity, they forget everything, and neither do they remember the rights of God Almighty and of mankind, nor do they remember their high morals. The Prophet Islam further says, True courage is to abstain from these idols and to recognize them is real wisdom and sagacity. It is the result of these idols that there is hypocrisy between people and that thousands are slaughtered and murdered. One brother violates the right of another and then on thousands and thousands of evils ensue. This happens every day and all the time. So much faith is put in resources that God Almighty has been deemed a useless part. Very few people have understood the true meaning of the unity of God. And if others are told of it, they immediately reply, Are we not Muslims? And do we not proclaim the Galima? Alas, they have only understood so much that if it is sufficient to utter the Galima from their tongues, yet they fail to comprehend the true purpose and meaning of the unity of God. They think that reciting La ilaha illallah, i.e. there is none worthy of worship except Allah, is sufficient. He then states, I say assuredly that if man recognizes the truth about the Kalima Tayyibah and puts it into practice, then he can make great progress and witness God Almighty's most wondrous power. The Prophet further states, Behold, I stand not on this station as a mere admonisher or to tell stories, but I stand to bear witness. I must convey that message which God Almighty has given to me. The Prophet Messiah continues by saying, I am not concerned if it is heard or not, or believed or not. You will have to answer to that. I must fulfill my duty. I understand that many people have entered into my community and professed the unity of God. But I say with regret that they do not believe in it. Whoever violates the rights of his brother or abstains not from other evils, I cannot trust that he is a believer in the oneness of God. The Prophet Messiah further states, To believe that God Almighty is one God, it is also necessary that the rights of his creation are not violated. The one who violates the rights of his brother and betrays him is not a believer in La ilaha illallah. To believe in La ilaha illallah or the one who believes in the unity of God Almighty does not then infringe the rights of mankind. Because this is such a blessing that causes an extraordinary change to take place in man right after attaining it. If you truly understand the meaning of La ilaha illallah, an astonishing change will be born in you. The Promise of Zayl Islam states, One is free of idols in the form of hatred, bitterness, jealousy, vanity, etc. and draws closer to God Almighty. This transformation and also to truly believe in the oneness of God can only happen when the internal idols in the form of arrogance, self-conceit, vanity, malice, enmity, jealousy, miserliness, hypocrisy, disloyalty, etc. have been removed. 
If a person wants to truly believe in the oneness of God, then one has to abandon arrogance, self-conceit, pretense, vanity, malice, and hatred. If someone comes in order to seek reconciliation and forgiveness, then one must forgive. One should not harbor malice and enmity in their hearts. One must refrain from jealousy, miserliness, hypocrisy and unfaithfulness. The Prophet Muhammad has stated that one must do away with all these ill habits and it is only then that one can truly believe in the oneness of God Almighty and develop a true comprehension of the creed that there is none worthy of worship except Allah. The Prophet Muhammad states until these idols exist within oneself, one cannot be truthful in his declaration of the creed. There is none worthy of worship except Allah. Because the presence of such ills repudiates one's belief in God. Thus, it is an undeniable fact that simply uttering belief in the oneness of God is of no benefit. Some recite the Kalima, Islamic creed. And yet the moment something is done which is against their nature, their anger and fury becomes their idol. In short, without the grace of God Almighty, one cannot rid themselves from the disease of the inner self and ego, and nor can one without his grace become truly established on Tawheed, i.e. the belief in the oneness of God. Simply uttering, there is none worthy of worship except Allah, cannot make one a believer in the unity of God. It is essential to consider Allah the Almighty as the most powerful being and the one who is truly worthy of worship. Only then can one abstain from employing different worldly ploys and the means in order to usurp the rights of others. Thus the essence of this extract of the Promised Messiah is that one who does not fulfill the rights of others and does not make an effort to seek reconciliation and does not end his enmity with others, does not truly profess the belief in Tawheed. This is such a subtle point that if one understands this, then we will become those who shall always lay the foundations of reconciliation and peace. And will also enable us to fulfill the rights of others. Therefore, every one of us needs to understand this and assess themselves. Otherwise, this will be a state of great concern for us if we claim to profess belief in Tawheed, but our practice is completely contrary to it. The Promised Messiah Islam, has outlined the various methods to discard shirk, i.e. associating partners with God, in his book, The Philosophy of the Teachings of Islam. There are various methods of how one can and should refrain from shirk. In regards to one of these, he states, Refraining from inflicting physical pain on anyone and becoming harmless and behaving peacefully. One of the methods of discarding shirk is that one should lead a life wherein one does not perpetrate any kind of injustice against anyone and nor cause them any harm. In fact, one should become completely harmless and should lay the foundations to establish peace and reconciliation. And it is very important to increase love and affection between one another. The Promised Messiah Islam further states, Without a doubt, peacefulness is a high moral quality and is essential for humanity. The natural impulse corresponding to this moral quality, the regulation of which converts it into a moral quality which is possessed by an infant, is attachment. It is obvious that in his natural condition, i.e. when one is not fully in his senses, man is unable to conceive of peacefulness or combativeness. 
اور نہ جنگ جوئی کے مضمون کو سمجھ سکتا انسان اگر یہ خلق جو ہے The moral quality of peacefulness and seeking reconciliation develops from a natural impulse which is possessed by an infant because children immediately forget and seek to make peace. And so the Prophet Messiah states that man can only truly comprehend this natural state if one possesses intellect. If one lacks reason, then one will not be able to conceive of peacefulness, nor combativeness. He will fail to identify when one needs to make peace, and which circumstances one has to engage in combat. The Promised Messiah is known for the states. In that condition, the impulse of attachment that he exhibits is the root of peacefulness. But as it is not exercised under the control of reason or reflection and with deliberation, it is not accounted as a moral quality. It becomes a moral quality when a person deliberately makes himself harmless and exercises the quality of peacefulness on its proper occasion. If one does not possess the intellect or the strength at the time, or perhaps is still in a state of infancy, then that action cannot be accounted as a high moral quality. It will only be deemed as a high moral quality when one can make a careful assessment of all the circumstances and then with one's full intention and with a concerted effort seeks to establish peace and exercises this on its proper occasion. For instance, if the circumstances are such that a country or a nation is required to engage in war, then such decisions are to be made by not foregoing justice and reason. In fact, they ought to be done by taking into account its proper occasion and place, and after careful deliberation. The foundation of peace should be laid on its proper occasion and place, as only then will it be deemed as a high moral quality. The promised Messiah lay salam further stated, It becomes a high moral quality when a person deliberately makes himself harmless and exercises the quality of peacefulness on his proper occasion and refrains from using it out of place. In this context, the divine teaching is, which means, and set things right among yourselves. And reconciliation is best. And if they incline towards peace, incline you also towards it. Allah the Almighty then states وَعِبَادُ الرَّحْمَانِ الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ حَوْنًا And the servants of the gracious God are those who walk on the earth in a dignified manner. Allah the Almighty also states وَإِذَا مَرُّوا بِاللَّغْوِ مَرُّوا كِرَامًا and when they pass by anything vain, they pass on with dignity. Then the Prophet Sallallahu quoted the following part of the verse, اِذْفَعْ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنْ فَإِذَا الَّذِي بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ عَدَاوَةٌ كَأَنَّهُ وَلِيٌّ حَمِينٌ Which means to repel evil with that which is best, and lo, he between whom and yourself was enmity will become as though he were a warm friend. The promised Messiah states, that is, try to promote accord between yourself. Peace is best. When they incline towards peace, do you incline towards it also? The true servants, the gracious one, walk upon the earth in humility. And when they come upon something vain, which might develop into strife, 
they pass on with dignity. The Prophet Islam further states, they do not start quarreling over trifles and do not make small matters which do not cause much harm on occasion for discord. This means that until they suffer greatly, they consider conflict and strife to be harmful. The key principle of reconciliation is to eschew small and trivial matters and to overlook them. In Arabic, the expression vain that is employed in this verse means mischievous utterance of words or doing something which causes little damage and does little harm. If someone is speaking unnecessarily and by using profanities they wish to cause little harm then the method of reconciliation is that one should overlook such a vain act. So if someone wishes to cause harm then that should be overlooked peacefulness means that one should overlook the conduct of that type and should act with dignity but if a person's conduct does real harm to life or property or honor the moral quality that should come into play is opposition to it is not peacefulness but forbearance the Prophet Society then says, if someone attempts to cause one harm, then one should overlook this fact. One should shun it with a wise deed. The Prophet Society Islam further states, should anyone behave mischievously towards you, you should try to repel it with peacefulness, whereby he who is your enemy will become your warm friend. At one instant, the Prophet Society Islam stated, the reason for establishing this community is that one's tongue, eyes and in fact every part of their body should be infused with righteousness. The radiance of righteousness should be visible inside them and prominent on their exterior. They should become an outstanding model of pristine virtue. Furthermore, one should not become enraged or easily lose their temper. The Prophet Sahil Islam further states, I have seen that the majority of the Jamaat still have this ill habit of losing their temper. They harbour malice and rancour for one another over the most trivial of matters and quarrel with each other. People of this temperament have no association with our community. I fail to understand the reason why if a person uses abusive language towards another, the other person is unable to remain silent and not answer back. Every reformation for our community begins with reforming one's morals and disposition. It should be the case that initially one should demonstrate patience and strive towards their moral training. The Promise of Sahih Islam further elaborates by saying, the best method of reformation is that if, for instance, someone uses abusive language towards another, that person should pray to God Almighty with a sincere heart for him to reform that individual. At the same time, he should not harbor any malice towards that person. The Promise of Sahih Islam then says, just as laws exist in worldly institutions, similarly divine laws also exist. If one is bound to act upon worldly laws, how can it be that God Almighty will permit his laws to be contravened? Thus, until one reforms oneself, they will hold no value in the eyes of God. The Promise of Sahih Islam further states, God Almighty never desires that one should abandon outstanding moral qualities such as meekness, patience and forbearance, and then to replace them with brutality. If you make progress in terms of your moral virtues, then you will quickly find the path that leads to God Almighty. Thus, our purpose of being counted amongst the community of the Prophet of Sayyid Islam is to seek the pleasure of God as well as firmly establishing the oneness of God in our hearts. As the Prophet of Sayyid Islam has mentioned, in order to do this, one must adopt those attributes which are directly related to Hukuk al ibad which one can acquire by fulfilling the rights of others. On one occasion, whilst advising us, the Prophet of Sayyid Islam states, if one has forged a relationship with me and one claims to have become a part of my army, then they must adopt the highest of morals and abandon the habit of rebellion and agitation. 
regarding those who have formed a connection with him, the Promised Messiah stated, You should cleanse your hearts, increase your sympathy, and empathize with those who are in need. You should ensure that peace and harmony is established in the world. In turn, this will enable their faith to flourish, and Islam will spread as new avenues of propagating the message will open up. The Promise of Sayyid Islam stated, Therefore arise, seek repentance, and ensure your true Creator is content with you. At another instant, whilst advising us to remove all malice and rancor from our hearts, empathizing with fellow man and establishing the foundations for peace, the Promise of Sayyid Islam said, at this point in time, I would like to advise my community who deem me to be the promised Messiah that they should always stay away from these immoral customs. God has sent me as the promised Messiah and has adorned me with the mantle of the Messiah, son of Mary. I therefore admonish you, refrain from evil and be truly compassionate towards mankind. Cleanse your hearts of malice and spite, for you will become like angels through this habit. It is a filthy and unholy religion that is devoid of sympathy for humanity and polluted is the path riddled with thorns of rancor based on selfish desires. O ye who are with me, do not become like such people. Think about what is it is that we seek to attain through religion. Is it to constantly oppress others? No. Indeed, religion exists so that we may obtain the life that lies in God. Such a life has not been and will never be attained unless divine attributes come to abide in you. Be compassionate towards all for the sake of God so that you may be shown mercy in the heavens. Come and I will teach you a way that will cause your light to prevail over all other lights. Abandon all lowly spite and jealousy. Be compassionate for mankind and lose yourself in God. Being with God, achieve the highest levels of purification. This is the path on which miracles are bestowed, prayers are accepted, and angels descend to one's aid. But it is not a single day's work. Advance and continue advancing. Learn from the example of an individual who washes clothes. He places them in boiling hot water until the heat causes dirt and filth to separate from them. Then, rising in the morning, he soaks the load in water and beats the clothes on stone sills. The dirt that has settled in the clothes is thus slowly removed. This process of heating clothes and beating them continues until they are as clean as they were when new. When washing clothes, one has to scrub them constantly or the man who washes clothes has to beat them on a stone sill or nowadays there are washing machines and eventually all the dirt is removed this is the example that has been given here the promise of Sire states they become clean as if they were new this is the only strategy for cleansing the human soul your entire salvation depends on this cleanliness alone. This is precisely what Allah the Almighty has said in the Holy Quran. I.e., this means that only that soul will attain salvation that is cleansed of all types of dirt and filth. Thus, we should strive to cleanse our souls as mentioned in the example above of the clothes being washed. May Allah the Almighty grant us the opportunity to act upon the teachings of the Promised Messiah and through this may we show compassion to our fellow mankind. May we lay the foundations of peace whilst also understanding the true meaning of the oneness of God.
May we spread love and compassion in society we live in. May we prevent ourselves from succumbing to the worldly desires. In fact, may we always seek the path that leads to attaining the pleasure of God, and may this be our primary target. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, Nahmadu, and a Sainu, and a Stafferu, and no menu be, and a Tawakalo, Ale, and also the law, him in Shururian for Seno, women say,